we've been looking at a, a series on foundations. We've been looking at how are we to build our life. In fact, we sang about it right now. We said, I will build my life on you, Jesus. But there's all these components, these elements, these firm foundations that you and I, God says, I, I, I want to build you. I want to build you more in what I've got for you. And um, I was wondering if you've ever asked this question. For the majority in the room, I'm pretty sure we are Christians, which means that you are uh, saved, which means that you've made a choice in your life to live your life for Jesus. You've made a decision to believe in Him and to follow Him as your Lord and as your Savior. And there's a whole lot in that, but that's what you've done. If this morning you are here and you are not saved, my real hope for you this morning and what you've heard and experienced is that your heart would be longing for him. If you look at what the kids were learning about this morning, that, that verse is just so beautiful. If you look for me, wholeheartedly you will find me. Jesus says to every single person, if you look for me, you'll find me. He's not hiding. He's not trying to be chased after. In fact, it says that he will draw us to him. All we need to do is humble our hearts, open our eyes, and say, Jesus, here you are. And if you have not asked Jesus to be in your life, that dramatic um, uh, skit done with Josh and Martin, yo, it was like a full-on movie. I was like, let's keep going. Let's find out where we're going with this. I mean, we know where we're going with it. But that was really well done. Well done to Shane, who put that video together in the wee hours of the morning. You can stay, Shane. We love you. You can stay. Um, but if not, my hope this morning is that you would say, Jesus, actually, I, I need you. I long for you, and you alone can save me from a guilty verdict that is placed upon me. But when you were saved, did you ever come to this point where you said, well, now what? I'm saved. I've confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now what? Is this the end of my journey? Is it now that I just have to hang on for dear life? Do I fight this grueling world until Jesus happens to come back? which we know he will, or until I pass on, do I try my best to be the better version of myself now that I am saved? Well, no, there's, there's so much more now that you are saved. What we see happen is that God will continually do a miraculous work inside of your life. The Bible uses some of this language describing what God does to us in our salvation. It says, you'll be born again. It's like you were a whole new person. You'll be born again. It says you'll be a new creation. It says the old has gone and a new life has come. The person you once were. And I wonder if you ever think about that person that you once were. Some of you don't want to go down that road too far. Sometimes it's worth going down that road. Just to remember, Lord, this is who I was without you. And if ever I think to be without you again, that's the person I will be. I was aggressive. I was angry. I had addictions. I did the most stupid things. I would not have my wife or my husband. I would not have these kids if I did not have you, Jesus. I would not have the career I had. I might not have, I might not have, I might not have. I'd be so lost and hopeless. When we come to salvation, that old is gone and new has come. The picture we have in water baptism, whenever we baptize in water, is we put you under the water and we bring you out because the old has died and this new life has come. In God, the work he does in us, we are different. And we grow to become more and more like Jesus. The moment you come to salvation, there's a change. Some addictions can stop immediately. I've heard the story of Dudley Daniel, who used to lead the NCMI translocal team that we partner with. He tells the story, and he had, he had a, a drinking problem pre-Jesus. I, I don't know if it would be classified as an alcoholic, but he had a drinking problem. And the first beer after he got saved, he was at a bar and he went and he took a beer. He said, barman, something's wrong with this beer. Give me another one. Took the next beer, also tasted horribly off and he realized what God had just done. He's like, you need to stop drinking this. This is not good for you anymore. And he stopped drinking. In a moment of salvation, something changed. And for some of you who are battling with it, addictions, over time, God restores and heals. There are desires you've had that now you no longer want. There are people in your life who were once there that you realize, actually, these guys aren't helpful anymore. They're just bringing me down. They're negative. They're consuming. They're not good any longer. Your behavior changes. Your culture changes. The very culture you grew up with, you realize, this isn't it. 
There's a godly kingdom culture I want to live with. God matures you from being a babe to maturity. You move from milk to solids. There's this growth in us. You grow in love. There's a love that is now in your heart that wasn't there before. There's a love that's bursting to express itself. There's this love for God that you might not be able to fathom. It's the love that pushed you to say, Jesus, I need you. It wasn't an academic reasoning and you weighed up the cost and said, Jesus without Jesus. Actually, Jesus without Jesus. This one seems better and you made a reasonable decision. Your heart made a decision. Moved and motivated with love and now your heart's saying, I want to show this love. How do I express this love? How do I show this God who loves me how much I love him too? And you start to pursue him and you display this love. Peter Pollock, an ex-South African cricketer, the family member of Sean Pollock, who you might know better, he makes this statement. He says, if you know Jesus, you will know change. But if there's no Jesus, there will be no change. No Jesus, no change. No Jesus, no change. You got it? Good. Come see me afterwards if you didn't get it. Right? But that's the point, is that part of the roots of our life, part of us growing is that God is doing an incredible work in us. We're filled with this living water that produces a life in us and a fruit in us. This is what you and I all need. We all need this to live well for what we need to do. God works in us. But then here's what God does as well. He puts us into a community that we will not live our lives alone, but that we live our lives with others. So I'm saved And then God says, now that you're saved, I do not want you to ever be alone. I don't want you to do this alone. But God says, I want to put you into a community. He wants people to be in your life because you need people in your life and people need you in their life too. There's always a double way in this relationship. The Bible says things like this. God will put the lonely in family. It says that he will put the orphans in a home and give the orphan a family. It says that he'll provide care for the widow. Jesus says, I will never leave you alone. I'll send the Holy Spirit to always be with you. And I'm with you always till the very end of the age. There's this language that God continually uses to say, you are never supposed to be alone, feel lonely, be independent, be isolated, feel vulnerable. But the picture of the Bible continually, God's culture, God's heart, is that now that you're saved, He wants you to be amongst people. And we see that a lot of those people coming together is called the church. This is the church. Now, in the Greek, the word church means ecclesia. And I'm always nervous because I know we've got some Greek friends in the crowd, and you always judge my Greek, but you love me, and I'm gracious for your mercy. But ecclesia means, it's the Greek word meaning church, which means the called out ones. And here's who you become the moment that you're saved. We become the called out ones Because now we belong to Jesus. We belong to his kingdom. We are those who gather together. We are those who are summoned because of the gospel. You are the called out ones because of the gospel. You've been summoned because of the gospel. You and I were called out because we belong to a kingdom. We belong to a God. You are not saved by Jesus to be alone, but you are saved by Jesus to belong. You now belong to a community, a fellowship. And this, friends, is... The next foundation that I want us to look at this morning, how we can best build our life, is that we build our lives in relationship and in partnership with other people. So we're going to look at that this morning. It's important for us to know the church, when we speak about the church, when we speak about the called out ones, the church is not a building. My older son, Nathan, he's getting wise in his older age. He saw there's a picture on there. And Misha, this is something you can note. It says there a picture of the smallest church in the world. He said, Dad, this is wrong. He said, that's the smallest church building in the world. But the church is the people. He's like, come on, Dad. That's a rookie error. I was like, sorry, bud. You got me. Well done. I was proud and embarrassed, but I was proud. But he's right. The church is not the building. There are really big buildings in this world with a very small church. And there are very tiny buildings in the world with very big churches. The church is not a building, but the church is not an organization. This is not a money-making scheme. The church is not a preaching venue. 
I haven't, and Marcus hasn't, and the eldership hasn't created this because we've got a few people who like to speak to people. This is not what this is about. We're not a social club. We're not an NGO. Instead, here's how the Bible describes the church to be. The church is a family. Jesus' language like God will be a father. In the church, you'll find fathers. You'll find mothers, brothers, sisters. We are sons. We are daughters. We're adopted. We're in a home. The church is described as a body. We're united as a body. There are many parts here. We're all different, but we're, we're united. We're together as one. The church is described as a marriage. Jesus being the groom coming for us, his bride. The church is described as an army. Many together on mission together, stronger together, pursuing the advancing of the kingdom of God together. Imagine an army of one. Would you be afraid of an army of one? Not at all. But we're called to be an army. We're called to be a kingdom. Innumerable people belonging to a kingdom, serving a glorious king who is Jesus all of these pictures, and there's more, show a togetherness that you and I ought to be in, a unity. This is what the church is meant to be. It's organic, it's alive, it involves people, it involves the best of us and the worst of us coming together as the called out ones for purpose. In this, friends, we need to display this value. There's a value that we, we, we teach you, it's a value that was, was, was started when NCMI came together and it's a phrase that says we ought to live with friendship before function. Friendship before function. And the, the better definition is that we ought to live with friendship in function. We ought to be friends in our function. Let's look at both of those together. If you have friendship alone and you do not pursue the function that we're called to do, then all we become is a social club. All we're doing here is sipping tea and enjoying cucumber sandwiches, if you enjoy those. But that's all we do. We're chatting about life and about the latest series and about, I don't know, what the fashion trend is and what the weather's going to do, because we talk a lot about the weather. But without function, without mission, all we are is social. Let's take the function out. Sorry, let's take the friendship out. If all we do is function, if all we are as a church is on mission, well, then we become very corporate-like. We are simply around each other because we have to be. We don't choose this crowd. We're obliged to be in this crowd. This is where God said you had to be. This is the company that hired you. These colleagues, you've got to put up with them. You've got to laugh at their jokes. Ha, 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 good one again. It becomes dead. And what happens is if you're only operating in function without friendship, you'll start to get lonely. And what happens is you allow grievances and strained relationships to exist. And the mission actually begins to get hard. We need both. In this mission that we are on, because church, we are on a mission, we need to have friendship. We need to be in friendship, in mission. We need friendship in our function. The root that we've got to sort out for us to operate and function within friendship in function is love. It's love. Again, the Bible is full of a message of love. Continually, it's all about love. And this is a root, friends, that we have got to dearly work on. That the, 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 the men and women who are listening to Jesus and all he's teaching, they eventually ask him this question. They come to this point and they say, we want to live well. We want to live obediently. We want to live correctly and rightly. Jesus, what should we do? What should we do to live the way that you think we best would and should live. And here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 to 40. They say, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? What's the biggest thing we ought to do in our life? What's the biggest commandment in the law? And here's what Jesus says to them. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. If you want to live well, friends, love the Lord your God with all you have, and then love the people that are around you in that same similar vein, in that same fashion. Let's have a look at the first relationship that we ought to fight for, 
we ought to value, and we ought to pursue. We see it in verse 37 to 38. It says, the first relationship we need to build is our upward relationship, okay? It's our relationship that we are to have with God. God's plan for salvation was solely that our relationship with him could be restored. God chose to save us to restore a broken relationship. Jesus took on our sin. Jesus took on our punishment. The Son of God, who was never separated from the Father, from before the beginning of time, for an eternity, Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit were always together. Always and always and always together. Jesus was never separate from the Father until one moment when Jesus made the choice to go on the cross. For me, when Jesus asks the Father, if this cup can pass, he says this in the Garden of Gethsemane, the evening before he's about to be crucified, it says the, the, the sweat coming from Jesus' brow was tinged with blood. And that's out of the stress that he was experiencing. He says to God, he says to the Father, he prays this prayer, he says, Father, if I don't have to do this, please don't let me do this. But the Father says, this is my will. There's no other way. You have to do it. And Jesus says, so as you say, I will do it. And I know we often think, I would think this, if I'm about to be lashed with a whip 39 times, if I'm about to have a crown of thorns, if I'm about to be mocked, if I have to be stripped naked and carry a cross up a hill, if I'm going to be nailed to um, a, a cross uh, to be crucified, this death penalty, if that's all going to happen, then I too would say, Father, please no. But yet I don't think that was the main factor for Jesus saying, Father, please no. I think what Jesus realized was, would be on that cross, he would carry the weight of our sin. And what would that mean? It would mean for the first time ever, the son would be separated from the father. And for Jesus, that was unbearable. Gee, father, please may I not be separated from you. Please may you and I not be separated. May I not have sin that you and I would not be okay. Please may you not pour your wrath on me because of the sin that I'm about to carry. Did that happen? Well, here's the clue. Jesus always says, Father, 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 until he's on that cross and then he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's referring to Psalm 22, and the victory of that is that actually God will restore. The point I'm making is that God so fought for our restored relationships that Jesus says, I'm willing to forfeit for a moment my relationship with the Father to restore your relationship with the Father. That is reason to worship. Jesus says, I will separate myself so that you can be restored. Our first relationship, friends, is with the fathers, with God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And in that relationship, um, we are to partner. Let's look at some of the verses it says. Now in this relationship, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9 says, we're all called to be God's fellow workers. In relationship, we're called to partner. We're workers. In 1 Corinthians 5 20, it says, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. Now that you're in relationship with God, partner with God. Be an ambassador. That means you now represent the kingdom of God everywhere you go. Your citizenship has changed. Were someone to ask you for your ID document, you could metaphorically take out one that says, I belong to the kingdom of God. I represent the kingdom of God. Here is my citizenship. I belong there. And right now, I'm a foreigner in a foreign land. I'm in exile. But one day, ambassador, you will be called back home. And you will go back home to your kingdom where you'll celebrate in the culture and in the life that you've been saved into. We're even called to be priests. We see it throughout scripture. It says that you are the priesthood of believers. And as priests, you get to serve your God. Serve for your God. And there's this partnering in relationship with God. But what I want to focus on for the rest of this morning is just to spend some time on the next relationship that we need to focus on this morning and that we see in verse 39, love your neighbor as yourself. The relationship you and I are to have with one another. We're saved. We become the called out ones, the ecclesia. We're part of a kingdom. We're part of a family. We're led by God. We're given a mission. Jesus gives every single one of us a mission. And then he says, you can't do this alone, but I'm going to put you in partnership with God. And you're going to be used by him for his kingdom. But then, importantly, we're called to partner 
together. We're going to do this together. We're brought together to live our lives together in relationship and to partner together in our service of God. Michael Eaton makes this comment. He says, to love God is quite easy, but to love people is far harder. You might say, yes, that makes sense. But I can't quite question if you love God because I can't quite see the evidence. But I can definitely see the evidence if you don't love the person around you. So whether you love people is far more revealing than whether or not you love God. And that's a sign of whether or not you're living in love is what you do with the people around you. So you might say, I love God dearly. And I say, okay, that's good. And I love people dearly. Well, where's the evidence? We can weigh that up. So it's just a warning. We can watch and see how do you love the people around you. We're called to love each other. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 to 12. It's this beautiful passage. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who's alone when he falls and is not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. The beautiful picture there is that there's strength and there's comfort in togetherness. And God is a part of that togetherness. 1 Corinthians 12, 25 to 26 says, speaking about this body that we're now a part of, it says, but the members may have the same care for one another if one member suffers. If one member suffers, we all suffer together. And if one member is honored, we all rejoice together. Again, there's this beautiful picture of togetherness. If someone suffers in this church, we all feel it. It's a body. And if one rejoices, we all rejoice. And I need you to know that. You don't suffer alone and you don't rejoice alone, but we get to do it together. And then Acts 2 verse 42, speaking about the early church, this group that's now gathered together. It started off with 120 in an upper room, 3,000 were added, thousands were added, but this was their value. They said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to fellowship. They devoted themselves to fellowship. This togetherness was so important. It wasn't an added extra. It was a component of devotion. What should you focus on a lot in your life is the fellowship that you're called to be a part of. So friends, our foundation this morning is that you and I would hear God's desire for us not to be alone. Do you feel alone? Are you doing this life alone? And if so, why? Is it because you feel you will not be accepted? Hey, they accepted me. They got the worst in already. Don't worry. You're going to be better. Is life feeling lonely? Is life feeling hard? It's not God's plan. You're never called to go on mission alone. You should never pack your bags and say, They won't even know I'm gone. We'll know. I hope we'll know. But you're called to be a part of something stronger and better. The bride is far more beautiful when you're in it and far less when you're out of it. But the hope this morning is that you would make a decision in your heart to say, well, God, I need to belong to a community. And perhaps it's this community here. Perhaps it's this Bedford View site where I get to build my life with others. I get to trust these people. We are not called to solely be in a relationship, but we need a partner. So let me end this morning. Let's have a look at some of what partnering could look like. Partnering means that you're integrated and you're functioning in the church community. We teach this in our DNA uh, course. We teach this the moment you come in. We say, we don't want you to just be here. Until if you've said, I want to be here, we're like, great. Are you integrated? Are you amongst us? Are you involved with community and group? And then are you functioning? You see, you've got something that God wants to do in your life here. The smallest of things to the greatest of things. God wants you to do something. He doesn't want you to come in at 10 past nine, and forgive me if this is you. He doesn't want you to come in at 10 past nine, and the moment I say amen, you go out. That's not what God's called you to do, and you're only here on a Sunday. And if that's you, I'd love for you to hear this word this morning and say, I need more. You're integrated, you're functioning. Partnership means developing a caring, loving relationship within this community. It doesn't mean we just bear with one another. It means you start to learn to love the people that you're around. When we pray for you, we don't do it because we're obliged to. We do it because we care. 
There are tears in our, in our eyes. For Jolie this morning, there are tears in our eyes because of what God has done in your life because we cared, because we remember when we prayed. We remember the story of there's a lady in this community. We were hurt as a church. One suffered, we all suffered. And remember we prayed and we said, Lord, this is, this is months and months and months. Lenore crying, guys, we need to pray for Jolie. Please, we've got to pray. But now we rejoice as a church because of what God's done. We do it not because we have to. We do it because there's a care and there's a love in our hearts. There are people in this community who care for you and love you. There are people in this community who want to care for you and love you. Partnership means being accountable with those around you. Some of those around you. Who is watching your life? Who are you allowing to speak into your life? Guys, we, we need that protection. I need a team of men and women, Nicole being my first port of call for accountability, that if I step out of line, they can come to me in love and say, Greg, you did something wrong. You shouldn't have told the whole church that Nicole's turning 40 this year. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Man, next week I will not. But who's keeping us accountable? Who is speaking into your life? When your marriage is going through difficulties, who are you saying, listen, can you just pray with us? Can we just have a meal together and let's just tell you what's going on? And most likely that couple says, oh, we've been down that road. But hey, we can get through it. Let's walk a journey together. You're not alone. I'm feeling so depressed. Work is so hard. I'm financially struggling. Uh, I'm having a relationship issue with a friend. I don't know what to do. Who is walking with you? Be accountable. It means honoring uh, the people that are around you. Friends, please can we pursue a culture of honor because the world has a culture of dishonor. The world will try and tram people down to elevate yourself. You'll try and because of insecurity and because of culture of comparison, you will always try to be better than the person next to you. That should not exist in the kingdom of God. The kingdom says you honor the person next to you and if they do far more than you do, it's because they're standing on your shoulders because you honor them. Honor the people, honor the leaders. We are not perfect. We will make mistakes, but please do not speak ill of leaders or life group leaders or the person sitting next to you. Do not do that. It's too easy, but it's so damaging. Choose to honor and honor. And when someone dishonors, you correct them and say, sorry, you're speaking out of line. You honor your leader. And if there is a dishonor, you go to the person, you speak to them and say, I'm, I, I feel there's an issue. We do that. But let's hold up honor. God values honor. David honored King Saul. Although David was anointed to be king, Saul was mad and trying to kill David. David would constantly honor Saul because he was God's anointed. He says, you do not touch that man. Partnership means that you're willing to forgive you're willing to be relationally healed and you're willing to work through breakdowns. Wouldn't it be fantastic if we were all perfect and we all said the right thing at the right time? But we're not and we do say the wrong thing at the wrong time and we do offend and we do sometimes not look at you the way we should and we didn't notice you wearing a new top or we didn't notice your hairstyle's new. I don't know, it's the whole stuff. And like I've said many times on WhatsApp, we didn't reply within two days and we offended you immensely. We blue, we blue ticked you and we didn't reply. The biggest crime in social media. But partnership means I will forgive you. How many times? Jesus says 70 times 7. If your maths is poor, that's 490. If your maths is poor, you probably can't keep count to 490. That's a good thing. But what Jesus meant was you just keep forgiving. Keep forgiving, keep forgiving. And it means that if there's a relationship breakdown which exists, there are relationship breakdowns in this church, and we as elders say, go and talk to the person. You go first to them. I don't want to hear your drama. Go sort it out with them. And often you do, and there's a hug, and there's a let's love one another. Partnership means being available, being sacrificial. I'm here to be used. I'm here for your kingdom, God. That's what partnership means. It, it's you putting up your hand. Guys, can I tell you, this big weekend is such a beautiful example of people being sacrificial and people being available. Like Misha said, this venue did not look like this last night at six o'clock. And in an hour and 45 minutes, it was changed because men and women were everywhere around this building just doing stuff. They did not get paid. They got a photo. But they did it because they said, I'm part of this body. And for the greater part of the kingdom, here I am, I'm available and I'll give a sacrifice. Some of the sacrifices involve muscles and hips and things like that, but they will be restored. Last two. 
Partnership means we look at our differences and we celebrate them. I love it that you are different to me. I love it that God has given you different gifts to mine. I love it that you've got different skills and character and personality and abilities. I love it. Because when we celebrate each other's differences, we are far stronger for the kingdom of God. So instead of trying to cookie cut each other, we look at each other and say, here's your gift. Where does God want to use you? Here's your gift. Where does God want to use you? Here's your gift. And we celebrate the difference that we are. And lastly, of not a full list, partnership means that you're committed to stay. This is where I belong for now. This is where I'll be. I'm going to stay. I'm going to grow. I will be led and I will live out my call in this place. Guys, please don't ever just leave and think that's the way to do it. Don't ever do that. The elders will give an account for every sheep that's come within this shepherd pen. We'll have to give an account. And those who just slip out, it's hard. It's great this morning we could pray with Jolie and say, we're sending you with love. We're sending you with blessing. We get to send you. Please be here. Stay here. Be a part of what we're doing. Why? Because God wants to do something in your life. And if we're not the church for you, we'll, we'll help you find a good church to go a part of. We've got nine other sites that we'd love for you to go and be a part of if that's where God's called you to. But if it's here, stay, grow, be led and live at your call. And then friends, we partner beyond this community. We partner with nine sites. We partner with a translocal team called NCMI. We're partnering, we're partnering, we're partnering. We're not alone for a moment. And we've seen the kingdom of God go out. All those gold little stickers up on the wall there, those are us partnering. That's not a boast. That's us that's a saying, how good are we that we're not alone? We're strong because we're not alone. Could I ask you to stand? I just want to pray for us and end with a challenge. So here's the challenge. This is a family. And we don't just allow anyone into this family. And if you're part of that family, you should be happy. But we do ask that we get to know you. We do want you to be a part of this because this is God's plan. But if you're alone, can I ask you, if you are someone who's living out your Christianity alone, you're not accountable with somebody, you're not walking with somebody, you don't know too many people. If you're not in a life group, and statistically from what we think, that's four out of ten of you are not in a life group. The reason why we push life groups so much is not because it's just something we have, it's because it's something that's valuable. The fact to do life with people, that's the best way we know how as a life group. If you're not in a life group, why don't you come even tell me what you're struggling with? Because I've been there where I was the new guy. I felt the nerves. I felt the awkwardness. But my life is far better because I took a step of trust. And I took a bold step and said, I'm going to trust this group of people with my life. I tell you what, my life is far better with these people than it would have been without it. I've, I know what it's like to work out my faith alone, and it was hard. There was condemnation, there was judgment, there was guilt. God was an angry God when I was alone. But I know what life has been like in my life, my walk with Jesus, with a friendship and with a community. I can call on many of you at any moment, and I know that you'll love me. The moment my dad passed away, within 30 minutes, I had 10 friends in the lounge. My mom didn't even know half those guys. 10 guys were in the lounge there. I didn't even ask him to come. Within 30 minutes of him passing away, I can't ask that. They came and they were there. I'm a stronger man because of this community. Don't be alone. It's not what God wants for you.